Kiri steps out of the elevator onto the dimly lit roof. She walks a few paces and notes the various vents and other machinery on top of the building. The atmosphere up here is a lot different to that of the busting streets below. Masters of strangers making their way through the station. I wish you the best of luck. Kurzavall calls out to her. That the stars may guide you on your journey, young Kiri. Her eyes are still adjusting to the lower light, and she can barely make out Kurzavall's outline as she turns around to face him. Truly grateful for what the old man has done for her today, she subconsciously grips her cloak with a dominant lower hand and takes a half step towards him. She can't remember meeting such a genuinely nice person before, and she still has a hard time figuring out how exactly to respond to such kindness, resulting in a somewhat awkward situation for her. Thank you, she blurts out. The words almost stuck in her throat. For everything. She can't really make out his face, but going by her knowledge of the old man, he is probably smiling at her embarrassing display right now. No need to thank me, young one. Consider it a kind of reimbursement for the many things you have been denied in life. I wish from the bottom of my heart that one day you might set foot upon the cradle of our people, walk among our kin and experience for yourself the many wonders our beautiful home has to offer. Until then, should you ever be in need, do not hesitate to ask. Th thank you. Kiri stammers, a bit overwhelmed. She can hear a warm chuckle coming from him as Kurzweil claps his hands once more and bows slightly. Kindness in heart. Kindness in heart, she replies, having already taken a liking to that expression. He turns to leave and reaches for the door control. With a mechanical hiss, the elevator doors close, the old man vanishing inside, leaving her to her own devices once again. An uneasy feeling grips her and all kinds of questions pop up in her mind. Closing her eyes and taking a deep breath, she tries to dismiss them, and focus back on the task at hand, meeting up with Krogonar. Everything's going to be okay. She distracts herself by going through the route Kurzweil gave her once again, as she trudges to the edge of the roof, mumbling his directions to herself. Metal Rainian closes the roof area, the highest of the metal tubes reaching far over her own head. She grabs one of the rails, mild vertigo, and an uneasy feeling overcoming her, as she looks down to the street. This is by far the highest place she has been in her life. And he actually expects me to just... jump? She manages the old man leaping across the gap and sniggers at the sheer absurdity of it. Maybe he is starting to get crazy from old age. Feeling her legs still tremble from the steam-induced overdrive of her system, she takes a few steps back from the ledge. She jokes to herself as she stretches and gets into a starting position. Well, maybe we're both crazy. She takes off running, gunning straight for the edge of the roof. Her instincts are calling out to her, begging her to stop as she approaches the edge, but she ignores them and powers through. She jumps up, kicks off the railing, and leaps across the threshold. The moment her paws leave the ground, an indescribable sensation fills her. A sensation so intense and unique that she can't even hope to describe it. Her instincts are screaming at her. Countless scenarios of her slamming against the wall and falling to her demise try to fill her mind. And suddenly, everything quiets down. No sense of dread, no fear of falling. Just the sensation of wind blowing through her fur and that unspeakable feeling. Time seems to slow down as she soars through the air. She does not know what this is. She does not know why this is happening. But one thing she knows for sure. She is loving it. The moment is over as quickly as it begun. Her paws touch down on the other side, her tail helping her massively by keeping her balance and not face planting onto the floor. Her hearts are both pounding and her body feels light as a feather. She is enchanted by the thrill. There is a huge goofy grin on her face as she turns and faces the building she just jumped from. She breaks out in euphoric giggling and jumps up in excitement. I did it! After taking a moment to collect herself and somewhat calm down again, she continues to the railing of this roof, checking out the gap between the current and the next building. Noting that this jump should be even easier than the first one, she gets into position and follows the rush, sprinting towards the edge. A while later, she finds herself running out of breath, forced to take a short breather. So he really knew that this would work? Huh, she wonders as she catches her breath. That old man might very well be a genius for his idea. She didn't even run into a single Vorkudanti on her way here. None. She regularly chuckles to herself, out of breath and high from the rush, and perhaps from that stim too. Taking a few minutes to let her breathing slow down, she slumps against a metal duct and waits until her heartbeats calm down to a normal level. At least somewhat recovered, she pushes herself off the vent she leaned against and creeps closer to the edge of the roof. Looking down the side of the building, she can see the busy street beneath, countless people entering or exiting out of various businesses and locales, simply passing through or buying wares from shady-looking street vendors. Up here, she feels a comfortable loneliness, 
as if being on top of the roofs of these buildings and seeing the station for this perspective was her own secret, something special that nobody else has, her own little treasure. She stays like this for a while, losing track of time and getting lost in watching various people, tracking them with a playful predatory glee, as if out hunting. After getting bored with her latest victims, some funny looking reptilian tripeds, Kiri looks for other people to follow through the crowd. And her eyes land upon a pretty familiar looking Raukir, his massive form standing out from the crowd of relative giants, at least compared to her. By the looks of it, he is currently making his way towards a particular side alley. Found you. Not wasting any time, Kiri does some more house skipping, until she reaches the building with the dark alleyway next to it. Leaning over the edge and confirming that the person in question is actually down there, she grabs her clunky communicator from his pocket. I can see you. Sniggering, she grabs onto the railing and waits for his reaction. All he does is reach for his own comm unit and type a message of his own, completely unfazed. Disappointing. You might have got the wrong one, Re. Just wait and see. She takes a deep breath, pockets her comm unit and swings herself over the railing, gracefully jumping towards the metal wall of the structure across, grabbing onto some exposed piping that runs along the wall, then jumping back over to the building she was just on top of, and back to the other one. Repeating this pattern of zigzagging between the two buildings, she makes not a single sound as she lands on the damp metal floor of the shadowy side street. Hey Noir, she cheerily calls out. The armor giant zips around in surprise, but it only takes a split second to recognize her. Hello, Re, he greets her calmly. His massive frame approaches her and stops a few paces in front of her, still towering over her but making it at least a little bit easier on her to maintain eye contact. How did you get here? he asks. Huh, now that's something you'd like to know, huh? she jabs, winking at him. Yes, he states matter-of-factly. She mentally sighs before answering, having expected at least a somewhat excited reaction. Well, anyways, no reason to be mean about it. Someone taught me a pretty nifty trick, makes it a lot easier to get around this place unseen, without using those dusty-ass vents, she explains in a friendly tone, near his perked up. Oh, really? Hmm, she hums smugly, puffing up her chest and pointing towards the top of the building. She can almost see him racking his brain about what she just meant with that. Not that unique of an idea, though. Now that I know about it, at least. But it would like a chance, so I'll give it to him. She blurs out energetically. Just went up to the roofs and... Well, there's some house skipping. That's simple. He straightens at her choice of words, visibly alerted. That is dangerous, Ree. He scolds her. She's not too sure about that one. Oh, come on. You're still way better than walking around town and suddenly bumping into those chits, don't you think? Mm, forget about it. Follow me. In his usual stoic manner... He simply turns around and starts making his way back to the main passageway. Glad to see you too, she mumbles dejectedly. Her ears lean back. On their way toward the Kier Kier, they try their best to shake any pursuers, taking random turns, disappearing in side alleys, the usual. Things seem to be going great, until they enter Void knows which narrow side street this is and walk straight into a group of Volcadanti, apparently waiting for them already. Of course. Shit. She recognises a few of them, having met them only a few hours prior. Though a rather memorable member is currently missing, much to Kiri's delight, she tries and fails to suppress her malicious grin. The group of four starts coming closer, one of them leading in front, his throw a lot brighter than that of his buddies. No, you little bitch would turn up here eventually, he snarls. Miss me that much? I thought I gave your buddy a nice enough parting gift back there. Shut your damn snout, he explodes at her. Predictable as always. Oh, that's cute, she taunts, reveling in that chit's frustration. Re, this is not the time. Krognar cautions her from behind. Spoil sport. So, I take it you are the people looking for her, he calls out to the group, making himself even taller. His presence seems to have given them some of them pause, but the bright third one seems rather unimpressed. You seriously think a single Raukir is going to stop us? You're in for a surprise then. It seems to me like you really are thirsting after a fight. Krognar calmly states. Yeah, we do, Ice Brain, he sneers. Kareen knows about the low growl coming from deep down in her chest right now, and it's your last warning to whoever dares provoke her like that. Oh, you like that, idiot? Amazing, he laughs at her. Some of his buddies joining in on his mockery. That's it. They've gone too far. Her claws are out and her teeth are bared. Those chits are about to get fucked up. Krognar swiftly reaches out from behind and grabs her by her shoulder with a practice motion, before she can even take a single step forward. What the? She protested. Re, stay calm. This is exactly what they want. He tells her with his typical calm demeanor. But they... I know. So... And I don't care. She turns away from him, 
gnashes her teeth and hisses in frustration. Please, don't let them fool you, he pleads. I won't, she mumbles. You two done yet? The leader pipes in. Yes, Krogonar calmly replies. Kiri is simply giving the guy death stares. Oh, you're a feisty one. We're definitely going to have some fun later. Leave her be. The armored giant warns them with his rumbling voice, taking a step forward. Don't you know when it's best for you to just shut the fuck up? Oh, I'm getting tired of this. You! He points at one of his group. Go get that bitch. His buddy gives him a dirty grin as he walks past and stretches his shoulder. Kiri can feel Krogonar tensing up next to her, the smell of a fight thick inside of this dark alley. Halfway between his buddies and Kiri, a sudden loud banging noise sounds from the vent to the wall next to him, catching everyone present by surprise. The guy stops in his tracks and snaps his head over towards the source of the sound. Another, even louder bang follows seconds later. He starts hesitating, clearly torn between keeping his attention on Krogonar and the disturbance. An intelligible growling echoes out from the vent, and everyone's gazes are fixed on that point of the wall. Suddenly, a loud battle cry erupts in the vent, and it literally flies out of the wall, hitting the Volcadanti square in the chest, and finally throwing him down on the ground. One of his friends starts running over, but stops when something suddenly comes crawling out of the hole in the wall. It is a strange-looking bipedal creature, with little to no fur, except for that rather dense tuft on top of its head, a very short and stubby snout, and a lean build. She has never seen anything like it. It, no they, seem to wear some rather exotic looking clothing, with some kind of storage pouch on their back, an orange glowing stick fixed to their belt, and a weird looking utensil dangling from the side of their torso. They get up from the ground, grumbling something and start dusting off their arms and legs, before they slowly look around and suddenly freeze in place, visibly tensing up. Not happy about the sudden and brazen intrusion, the one that was making his way towards his friend changed his course to the newcomer, hastening his step and grunting at them. Got some nerve, you little shit, they shout. The newcomer seems to have somewhat realised what kind of situation they have found themselves in, and start waving their arms in front of them, making wild gestures, growling and talking even faster gibberish than before. Are they seriously trying to threaten the person already running at them? What is wrong with them? The Volker Dante doesn't seem to appreciate the wild waving around either, charging at the weirdo with full speed. Things happen fast. The newcomer stops waving and forms some kind of bludgeoning weapon with their, up until now, rather delicate looking graspers. The Volcadanti goes for a strike with his right arm as he reaches the weirdo. With an unexpected burst of speed and dexterity, the stranger dodges to the side, and their left arm shoots forward, violently hitting their attacker in the side of his torso with a dull thud. The Volcadanti staggers back and falls to the floor, wheezing and gasping for air. The stranger seems surprised, losing their stance and making some more gibberish growls as they lower themselves and take a look at their open grasper. You're dead! The leader shouts, snarling as the last two of them sprint towards the weirdo. The newcomer seems to have trouble evading both of them at the same time, giving the leader an opportunity. He swipes at the stranger and heads his side, drawing blood with his comparatively dull claws. His victim lets out a low grunt before striking back at him, but the strike is deflected by the other Volcadanti who is covering his partner. The two of them don't relent, permanently harrying the newcomer with strikes from different angles, putting them on the defensive and not leaving an opening. Kiri tries to rush to their aid, but Krogonar keeps her back, shooting her a look. Best to keep out of this, he rumbles. Don't get involved in a fight between two other parties, it never ends well. The only thing she can do is helplessly spectate the ball, wincing each time the newcomer is wounded by those chits. The fight draws on but seems to tip in favour for the Volcadanti, laying them many hits and taking only a few glancing hits in return, their instinctual group fighting giving them a huge advantage. But suddenly, the leader gets finally kicked between his legs, lifts a few centimetres off the ground and collapses on the ground, curled up in pain. The newcomer is panting heavily, swaying and visibly unsteady, their skin and hair tough strangely wet, but they have not given up yet. Krogmar, not wanting to stay on the sidelines any longer, decides to bring it to an end. The last standing Volkadanti doesn't miss the giant currently charging at him, running away and abandoning his friends. So much about that courage of yours, huh? Krogmar stops a few metres away from the stranger, getting a good look at them, as their swaying gets worse and worse, and they suddenly collapse on the ground. There is a series of sounds coming out of the hole in the wall, finally able to be heard now that the fighting is over. It sounds a lot like desperate animalistic cries to Kiri. Krogonar just stands there, probably not sure what to do, as Kiri rushes past him and kneels down next to the wounded stranger. They are pleading, Noir, she calls out. They are, he calmly says. Yeah, they are. Come over and help, she nearly shouts at him. Kneeling next to them, she hears them mumble some more gibberish growls as they directly look at her, their eyes staring straight into hers as they bare their teeth slightly and hold up their right grasp with a single digit extending towards the ceiling. Slightly taken aback by the weird gesture, she subconsciously scoots closer to Krogonar. What do you need help with? 
he asks, his voice steady and calm as always. Help me get them up. I think they are too weak to do it themselves, and you're way stronger than me. All right. Krog now reaches down and slices his arm underneath the stranger's form, propping them up into a seating position. Heavy, he grunts. What? Seriously? Yes. They were a lot heavier than I thought. Interesting. The furless weirdo growls some more at them, but they seem to be at least somewhat aware of their intent to help. Why are they constantly baring their teeth? Closing their eyes, they groan convulsively, wrinkles appearing on their skin as their face contorts. They need medical attention, Krog Narkani states. Yeah, even I can see that. Should we take them with us to the Kirkir? She asks. Hmm. The Kirkir are certainly going to want an explanation for all of this, he states. Fine with me, that person just saved our asses. I think that's the least what we can do. All right. He scoops up the stranger, audibly straining. You weren't joking, huh? No, they are exceptionally heavy for their size, but I can manage. Her eyes wander over to the large utensil that was hanging from the stranger's torso, now lying on the floor. A simple stick with some kind of metal lump on its end. Curious, she grabs it. Oh, wow. She definitely underestimated how much that thing weighs. By the void, what is this made out of? She groans as she finally lifts it up. I don't know, probably some kind of metal. Huh. Krognar starts heading further down the alley, Kari following behind her until the wounded stranger pipes up and grabs at him some more, evidently agitated at something, and pointing towards the open vent. Did you understand even a single word of that? She asks him. No. Yeah, me neither. What do you think it wants? He asks her. I don't know. Never met someone like them. I think they want something from there, he states. Hmm, could be. I do not know for certain, but it's my best guess, he tells her. All right, I'll go check it out, she tells him warily, before cautiously heading towards the hole in the wall. The scratching and the agitated whines have not stopped in the meantime, and they probably mean nothing good, so she turns around and looks at Krognar one last time, hoping to get some reassurance. Looking in his direction, her eyes meet that of the stranger instead, and they once again lift up their grasp with one digit extended, their expression still pained and exhausted. Stars above, what a day, she mumbles incredulous, as she approaches the opening. Taking a look inside, she can't make anything out, except for a form shifting in the dark. Hello, I'm here to help, she calls into the darkness, her voice echoing through the vents as she leans inside. Suddenly, something jumps on top of her back, using her as a means to drag herself out of the vent. Void, take me, what happened? She cries out startled. Re, I say this with utmost urgency. Do not make sudden moves and don't panic, Krognar tells her from behind. Wait, why? Her words are stuck in her throat as she turns around and notices what exactly just leapt out of that vent. Noir? She whispers loudly, a lump in her voice. Yes, he answers, staying perfectly still. Is that a blood beast? Yes, a young one. The beast races over to Krognar, bouncing up and down as it reaches him. The stranger grabs some more and reaches down from Krognar's grip towards the blood beast. What? Then instead of biting off the grasp of reaching towards it, the blood beast starts emanating a haunting series of sounds as the stranger literally runs his grasper through the beast's fur. 